All right, now Deuteronomy chapter 5, of course, a very famous section of Scripture. He, Moses is, is laying out the Ten Commandments. This is also found in Exodus chapter number 20. Is another list of the, of the Ten Commandments. Deuteronomy is kind of the, the recapping and going over everything um, in the law. But what we see here is the Ten Commandments. And Now, I'm going to be preaching kind of like a series. I'm going to be probably jumping around a little bit, maybe going out of order. But I'm going to be preaching out of all the Ten Commandments. Now, there's, I'm going to be skipping on your father and mother because I already preached an entire sermon on that one specific commandment a little less than a year ago. So I have that available if, you, if you're interested in that. But I'm going to be going through all of these, and some I'll be combining, and some I won't, um, just depending on the context. But I want to go through all these commandments because they're all important, and they're all things that we need to learn and to understand in our lives. And this is something that people say, oh, yeah, I mean, you might even have them all memorized. You might be able to repeat them all. But we're going to go a little bit more in depth and just study it, study it out and make sure that, um, that we're doing our best to try to obey these commandments. Now, the first thing I want to point out, if you look at the end of Deuteronomy chapter number 5, is that um, the commandments are for our benefit. I've mentioned this recently, but um, he says in verse number 29, this is, this is God essentially speaking, Oh, that there were such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. If we, if we were able to obey God's commandments always and just keep them all forever, it would be very, very well with us, with our children. God's commandments are good for us. Now, we can see that it's very plain with the, with the Ten Commandments. In many cases, you know, thou shalt not kill, shalt steal, of course, those, it doesn't take very much thought to understand why that's good for us and, and why we um, ought to be adhering and obeying these commandments. But um, some of them might not be quite as clear. We're going to go into in depth as to why that is. But um, I also want to point out this because this is going to be very relevant with, um, well, it's going to be what I'm preaching tonight, but I'll bring it up here anyways because it's relevant for all of them in general. A lot of people think that like the Ten Commandments are essentially the commandments of God and that's like the only commandments of God. No, the Ten Commandments are the Ten Commandments that were written in stone and given to Moses. And is there something special about them? Sure, they encompass a lot of truth, but that's not, the, that's not it. That's not like the entire law is just the Ten Commandments. God give, has given us a lot more, um, you know, look at the book of, Leviticus and Exodus and Leviticus and in Deuteronomy and you'll see there's a lot more let's say added but at least explained about the law and a lot a lot more details are, are you know pointed out and um, we're going to get into that tonight when, when I go over thou shalt not kill because that's one that's that's very commonly miss um, just people have confusion over that verse but we're going to be focusing in on commandments one and two this morning and if we could get to two, I'm not sure. They're, they're, they're both tied in together, so I'd like to hit both of them, but there's enough content to preach entire sermons on each. But I just wanted to show you that here in uh, verse number 20, or 31, excuse me, the Bible says, But as for thee, stand thou here by me, and I will speak unto thee all the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which thou shalt teach them, that they may do them in the land which I give them to possess it. So he had already given them the Ten Commandments. And he's saying, well, stand here. I'm, I'm going to give you more. I'm going to give you all the commandments, all of the statutes, everything that they need to know. And that's what we find in the, in the other um, passages in the Old Testament where Moses is giving the law. Um, pretty simple stuff, but I just want to point that out. But let's go back to the beginning of this chapter. <clears throat> and... Um, Verse number two says, The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. Obviously, this is the, the old covenant, right? Um, the covenant is if you could obey all of God's laws, you know, and keep all of them always, that would be good with you. That, that, is, that is actually one path to salvation. Now, is anybody capable of maintaining that? No, of course not. We're not able to do that. Jesus Christ is the only one that was able to do that, and he was God in the flesh. Um, God made this old covenant, but I just want to, man, I'm get, I don't want to get too far off topic here. Salvation has always been by grace through faith. The law was given, the, the New Testament explains 
that the, the law was given as a schoolmaster to, to lead us unto Christ. The law is given so that we can understand, hey, we're sinners. You know, this is God's standard for us. These are God's laws. And without the laws being spelled out, you don't realize necessarily how bad you are, right? You don't realize how, how corrupt you are, how, how you know, imperfect you are, until you can, you can measure yourself against these rules and say, oh, wow, yeah, I don't keep those always, right? I, ne I, need, I need help. I need a Savior because I, I, I can't do this. And that's, that's ultimately, and that's always been the purpose of the law. Not just in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament as well. But um, I, I, that's, that's kind of a whole other sermon as well. Let's focus in. Let's, do, um, let's start reading here in verse number 7, because this is, this is commandment number 1. Everything up to verse number 7 is just leading into um, you know, Moses talking to him face to face out of the fire. Verse number 7 says, Thou shalt have none other gods before me. And then commandment number 2, we'll keep reading here, verse number 8 Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them. Excuse me. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Now, these are commandments one and two, not to have any gods before him, before, before the Lord, and not to make any graven image and to bow down and worship them. The, the Catholic Church actually merges those two and says that whole thing is the, is the first commandment, and they split up the tenth commandment, which is basically not to covet. And they say they split up not to covet your, your neighbor's wife as one, and then not to covet all of their goods, as you know, those are nine and ten. But um, and there's a, I believe there's a very important reason why they do that, why they split it up that way, because of all of the idolatry that is going on and taking place in the Catholic Church with all their graven images and things like that. So it's easier just to say, well, we don't have any gods before God. We only serve the Lord. We serve one God, and we're obeying the first commandment in that sense. But. Um, and it kind of, kind of hides the, the fact that we're not supposed to be making any graven images. But I'm going to first go over just not having any gods before God. And you can see how these are related, right? I mean, making the graven images, falling down, worshiping them, these idols that people build up, and not having other gods before, they're, they're, they're tied together. But they are still two distinct um, Commandments, you can have another God before God without making an idol, without making an image, without making these things. You can be worshiping another God. Um, for example, I, I don't believe the, you know, the Muslims have like some statue that they call God. Right? When they worship Allah, it's just it's a different God. It's a fake God. It's not, it's not the real God. It's not the Lord. But they don't have you know, like commandment two says, these, these graven images and things, that, that's what they're worshiping. So these are split up. They're two different commandments. And I'm going to start with commandment number one. And if we have enough time, I'll get into number two. But like I said, I'm not sure if that's going to happen because there's a lot of content here. So flip over if you would. You're in Deuteronomy chapter five. Let's just look at Deuteronomy chapter six, one chapter over. We're going to look at some more Bible verses that talk about not having any other gods before the Lord. The Bible says in verse number 13 of Deuteronomy 6, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him, and shalt swear by his name. Ye shall not go after other gods, of the gods of the people which are round about you. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. We see here, you know, the reason why God says, I don't want to have any other gods before me is because God is jealous. And, again, and we, have a, we have a society today that uses the word jealous as, as a bad thing, like it's a negative trait to have. And oftentimes, and I'm going to go over this too in a, in a few weeks, preach a sermon on, on how the, the definition and the meanings of our words have changed over time. Um, it, it's natural. It happens with language. People have a tendency to start using words maybe incorrectly or in different circumstances and it just comes to be accepted that this is what that word means. And um, jealousy is, is something similar to that. But jealousy is not, if God's jealous, that is not a bad attribute. That is not a, 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 
a wrong trait to have. See, God's jealous because he wants the attention completely on him. And that makes sense, right? These other gods that, that people worship, they're not even real. They're fake. They're devils of anything. They're not real gods. God wants you, hey, he deserves the credit. He's the one that's doing everything for you. He's the one that's given you life. He's the one that's provided salvation as a free gift. He's done all this stuff for you. So it's a slap in the face to God for you to just be going off and making up some other god or worshiping some false gods. He's saying, look, no, I, want, I, I deserve the credit. I get the glory. You know, I get the respect. And when you start going off to someone else, that's, that's essentially what jealousy is. He's, he's jealous because no one else deserves that love and that honor as God than, than the Lord does. And, um, you know, the, the Bible talks a lot about jealousy. It's a whole other sermon in and of itself. But even within a marriage, you know, am I a jealous husband? Yes, I am. Why am I a jealous husband? Because I don't think my wife should be giving the attention that I deserve to another man. In the same way with her, you know, I shouldn't be giving other women this, this attention that, that ought to just be going to my wife. And now, does that mean I can't ever have a conversation with a female? No, of course not. But that's not the, you know, there's a, there's a difference between that and starting to form real close relationships with someone of the opposite gender and getting real close in, the, in that, you know, where you start sharing things. Hey, no, there, there's a special bond and a special relationship that a husband and wife have that ought to be kept solely to that person. And we need to watch out for that because there's, you know, especially today with all the adultery and fornication and everything that's running rampant, we need to protect our marriages and we need to make sure that we're not just so permissive and you say, oh, I don't care. You know, I, I trust her. He's like, do I trust my wife? Yes, of course, but I'm still jealous or I still don't want her giving her attention that I deserve to somebody else. And I'm still going to be very careful to, to just make sure that, that things are that way. And she does the same thing with me. It's a two-way street in that regard that, that neither one of us wants the other person even accidentally getting too close. Because what happens with all these adulteries it's always through people that they know. It's through coworkers. It's through these friends where, where people just fall in love with some other person other than their spouse. Why does it happen? Because they end up spending so much time with them and doing things that they should just be doing with their spouse and not um, getting so close to that other person. Now all of a sudden they feel like, I don't love my spouse anymore. I love this person instead. All of that can be avoided um, if you're guarding your marriage properly and if if you have a jealous wife and a jealous husband, it's, and it's not a, a negative or a bad thing, it's something that uh, that's completely out of love too. I love my wife so much, you know, I, and I want her to love me. <laughs> and you could say that's selfish, but that's what marriage is. And um, God's a jealous God, so um, <clears throat> that's why one of the reasons why we have this first commandment. Now. Um, Flip over if you would. Well, you know, stay in Deuteronomy. I'll read from you from 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Because I kind of brought this up a little bit. <clears throat> These other gods, you know, God said not to have any other gods before him. When you see the gods that's not referring to God in the Bible, it's always this lowercase g God, right? It's a, it's a lowercase God. 1 Corinthians 8 verse 4 says, As concerning therefore the eat, and this, is, this whole chapter is talking about eating things offered unto idols. And, and Paul's explaining this. You know, because a lot of people were, there's a lot of idolatry and, and he's just clearing up um, what, you know, what as Christians we ought to do in these situations. Verse number four says, as concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered and sacrificed unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. He's saying, look, these idols, these false gods, we know that that's just like a clump of metal. It's a stock of wood. It, it's nothing. It's inanimate. It's not a god. It has no powers. It has no special anything. It's just, it's just an object. We know this. Verse number five, he says, For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ by whom are all things, and we by him. He's saying we know that there are these inanimate objects. We know that they're nothing. But you'll notice in the Bible, it goes back and forth, it refers to these false gods as gods because that's the way that they're termed and labeled, and that's what people believe about them. So even though it's not really a God, like we have the Lord, the God, 
they're still called gods. And he explains in the whole chapter how even though you know, food is just food and if someone offers food unto an idol, um, we know the idol's not anything, it's not a real god. And technically you could say you know, eating the food, it's just food. But he says we still shouldn't do it for, for conscience sake. He's saying it's, 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 it's not right because if someone sees you partaking that, they're going to think you condone that and everything else. And it's a sin to be, to be partaking in food you know, or that's sacrificed unto idols that are false gods. Um, even though you may know that, hey, this isn't really a god. But um, whenever you see these lowercase g gods, you're going to find out that it's usually just talking about devils. And one of the reasons why I think people have ever even started worshiping gods and stuff, one, um, either they don't like the Lord, they don't like his commandments, they don't like his rules, so they want to make up some other god. But I do believe in, in spiritual beatings. I believe in angels and devils and that these things are real. And I believe that, that, that devils have appeared unto men. And I think that's where a lot of false religions have, have started from today. Um, you know, the, uh, Joseph Smith, for example, claims that, that he, had a, you know, he spoke with, a, with an angel of God. And that he was given these special revelation and the golden tablets and all this other stuff. Now, the man was a charlatan. It's proven from history. He was a scam artist and everything else. But I don't think it's impossible that he actually did have some type of revelation or something, but it wasn't from God. If he did it all, it was from a devil. It was from, you know, ultimately what ends up getting worshipped as a false god and as, as an idol. But... Um, these, these devils can communicate, I believe, sometimes with, with people. And sometimes people think they have visions and, it's, and they think it's God, but it's not really God. The Bible says, um, the quote is escaping me right now, but essentially that, that the devil is transformed into, a, into an angel of light and his minister is a minister of light. So they don't look like the red horns and the, the pitchfork and the tail, you know, as you see in the Looney Tunes uh, cartoons. They, they don't look like that. They look like they're ministers of light. They're, they're con artists. They're going to look as close as possible. They're going to look as good as possible to, to be as deceptive and to try to get you in and make you think, hey, this is the real deal. Hey, I could, hey this is from God. That's how it's going to appear. But that's not the way that they are. They're, they're like the wolves in sheep's clothing, like the, the false prophets, that on the outward side, they look pretty good, but inwardly, they're just looking to destroy. And... Um, I believe that's how devils come to people, and that's where a lot of these religions are founded from, is from that, um, that type of an event where people see things, they think it's really God, and it's not. It's a lie. It's a, it's a devil. Now, turn if you would to Deuteronomy chapter 13, because we're going to see how serious this commandment really is to not have any other gods before you. This is, this is for one, it's the, it's the number one commandment. It's, it's commandment number one. God's listing them all out. I'm not saying the other ones are you know, of less importance necessarily, but he decided to start off the very first one just saying, look, I'm God, have no other gods before me. This is, this is commandment number one. Let's get this established right now that I am the Lord and you will have no other gods. And there is a very serious, serious punishment associated with disobeying this commandment. Look at verse number 1 of Deuteronomy chapter 13. The Bible says, If there arise among you a prophet, and this is, again, this is the rest of God's law. This is where God's continuing to lay out his laws unto Moses and to give further explanation and to, and to just explain, hey, this is what's going on. Verse number 1, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So what he's saying here is, look, if some great preacher, if some prophet comes along and he's saying, you know, he's got, he's doing, you know, he has these dreams and then he gives you a sign with a one. He, he does something and, and, or says something and it actually comes to pass. And they're like, 
wow, you know, that's amazing. This guy's performed such an act, and how can he do that unless it's a power of God? And, and, but then he starts saying, let's go worship this other God. Hey, I'm a prophet for this God. It's not the Lord. He's saying, it, even if it does come to pass, even if what he says or what he does looks like a great sign, looks like it's amazing, he's saying, I'm proving you. Proving is testing, right? Don't listen to him. I want to see if you actually love me, if you actually have faith in me, if you actually believe me. Don't follow the charlatans. Don't follow these phonies, even if they can do something. I mean, think about the, the, the false prophets that were uh, Pharaoh's magicians. When Moses and Aaron came to Pharaoh and said, hey, let my people go, and, you know, um, Moses throws down his rod and it becomes a serpent, or Aaron throws down a rod and it becomes a serpent, right? And um, Pharaoh's magicians are like, yeah, okay, we could do that too. They throw down their rods and it becomes a serpent. So you see there's people out there, they weren't worshiping the Lord. They weren't prophets of God. They were false prophets. They were magicians. They believed in something else. They believed in these, these devils. But, um, and, and, the, and the magic and so forth. But then what happened is, of course, Moses snake ate up theirs. And then, you know, all throughout the, the, that whole um, series of events with the different plagues and stuff, those magicians were able to do quite a few things. Now, they weren't able to do everything. There's some things like creating the lice out of the dust. They could not just create that life. That was something they, they did not have the power to do that. But they did have the power to do a lot of things to be able to deceive a lot of people. And the Bible's telling us in Deuteronomy 13, you say, look, even if you see these things that, that look like wonders, and even in the last day, the Bible says in Matthew 24, that false Christ shall arise and false prophets and shall deceive many and shall do great, they'll have great signs and lying wonders. So when the Antichrist comes on the scene, He's going to be able to do a lot of maybe convincing things, things that would look like, wow, that's amazing. But the Bible's warning us saying, don't be deceived. It's a false Christ. It's not, he's not coming in the name of the Lord. You might say things you know, similar to that, but it's not going to be um, Jesus Christ. Because when Jesus Christ comes, the Bible says, every eye shall see. And every, you know, we're all going to see under heaven. It's going to come as a, as a lightning shines from the east unto the west. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And the cloud is not going to be a silent thing or a secret thing where people are just like, oh man, what happened? The Bible is very clear that, that it's going to be an event that everybody's going to be able to see. That, that when Jesus Christ comes back, there's going to be no doubt about it. So that's why when you, when you hear about these false Christs and they, hey, he's over here, hey, he's over there, hey, he's in the desert, hey, he's in the mountains, and he's doing all these great... No, 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 that's not how Jesus Christ is coming back. So we don't have to be deceived by that. But anyway, let's keep reading here. Look at verse number four, because we're going to see why, what, the, what the punishment is for disobeying this commandment. He's laying this out and saying, look, don't follow these people. Even if they do things that come to pass, don't be deceived by them. Verse four, ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. And this guy, someone comes along, and he's like, today in this country, we have freedom of religion. But is that how God established it in the Old Testament? No. He actually didn't. He says, if there's someone coming along and trying to get you to worship some other gods, they need to be put to death. Now, and it, this can really go against the grain with how we're, we're brought up. Because... We experience so much freedom in this country, and I'm not saying I'm ungrateful or unthankful or anything like that for all the freedoms that we have, but honestly, I still believe that even the Constitution of the United States is a, is a man-made document. It's infallible. It's not scripture. You could argue that there's been a lot of biblical influence going into it, and I would agree with that. There's been a lot of wisdom going into it that people have used from the Bible to give us these great freedoms and, you know, and to establish this kind of structure. But I'll tell you what, it's not the perfect government. God laid out for us in the Bible what would be the perfect government. Now, it didn't last very long. They people, you know, for the time when they had the judges and stuff and they had God's laws, that was the perfect government. And then they wanted a king and everything else and it just went downhill from there. But... In God's perfect government, this is what the law should be. Because there is one God. And people say, well, but that's just what you believe. No, it's a fact. There is one God and there's one Lord. 
And when you start to, to allow for, for you know, people to um, you know, just come and these prophets to come along and, 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 and lead people away from the Lord, that's sending souls to hell. That has a real repercussion. And it's, and it's very serious. And this, is, and this is ultimately, this is what God laid out. And again, I know that's not necessarily the um, very popular. People might think I'm crazy for saying that. Say, and people say, well, you're just like the Taliban then. You're like, the, you know, no. And the, the biggest reason is because they're worshiping a false god and a false idol. say, yeah, but they'll say the same thing about you. Okay, but the truth is still the truth. There still is only one God, and the Bible still is God's word, and this is a fact, and, and this is what the Bible says. And I'm not going to cover up for it. I'm not going to try to hide it, but we're going to look at it and learn from it and see what God's word actually says about the subject. So let's see. He says in verse 5, again, and that prophet, that dreamer, dream shall be put to death. It's a capital crime to try to lead people away from God because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. It, gets, it, it keeps on going. Look at verse number six, because that's talking about a false prophet. You say, okay, I can see that. This guy's coming along and he's doing, he's like, you know, this is, this is just a devil and he's trying to lead everyone away from the Lord and he should be put to death. Look at verse number six. It says, if thy brother, the son of thy mother or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, entice thee secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers, namely, of the gods of the people which are round about you, nigh unto thee, or far off from thee, from the one end of the heaven, of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. Thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken unto him, neither shall thine eye pity him, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him, but thou shalt surely kill him. Thine hand shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterwards the hand of all the people. And thou shalt stone him with stones that he die because he hath sought to thrust thee away from the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And all Israel shall hear and fear and shall do, more, do no more any such wickedness as this is among you. That's really serious. He's saying, if it's your own son, if it's your own daughter, if it's your own wife, you can't spare. You can't hide it. You can't conceal the matter. You can't just pretend like it didn't happen. Now, I don't know about you, but I think about this stuff and, and wow, what a dilemma. Because you love your family. You love your friend. You know, he said you have a friend that you love as your own soul. Someone that you just, I mean, they're your best friend. And you guys are going, you have to, and he says, not only do they have to be put to death, your hand is going to be first upon them. What this does, this is, this is really just, just, God's making it, pushing it to the front of saying, do you love me more than you love everybody else? Or do you love other people more than you love me? There's nothing wrong with loving other people, but the love of God has to be number one. And he's saying, you have to be willing even to do this. Even to do this. If someone, if, if your own wife, if your own child is going to try to try to steer you away and say, no, we, you know, don't, don't serve the Lord. There's this other God that we got to serve. That's serious. And look at what, what happens with this type of punishment. If this is actually enforced, if this is actually put through, he says, all Israel is going to hear and they're going to fear and they're not going to do it. And this is one of the reasons why I believe that the, the capital punishment should, should definitely be used and instituted because when you start giving, and appropriately, of course, right, uh, the way that the Bible lays out for the, for the appropriate crimes, when the proper punishment is actually given and it's public and people can see it, it's a deterrent 
for future crimes. I mean, think about this. How many people do you think would be committing adultery today if the law of the land was that the adulterer and the adulteress are both going to be put to death if they get caught doing that crime? How much do you, do you really think we'd see as much of it as it is going on today? Do you really think the divorce rate would be upwards of like 50%? I don't know what the statistics are. They're always changing because they're always going up. But like half of the marriages in America are just leading in divorce. And what's the, the, the primary purpose for that? It's because of adultery. It's because of somebody else. Because, they, oh, I don't love this person anymore. I love this person. Would that really be going on as much if that was the law? I don't think so. I think a lot of people would be like, okay, I want to do this, but it's not worth my life. <laughs> this is something that I could control. And I will, I will just, just say, okay, no, we'll, we'll, you know, at the very least, I'll make sure I get divorced before I do anything else, but I'm not going to commit this act of adultery because I don't want to be put to death. And these types of laws were given for that, for that very reason. And before God instituted the death penalty, and we were going over this in the book of Genesis, you know, the, the world, at, at, ever since, you know, Cain slew his brother, right? The, the wickedness just abounded. And Cain was banished, but he wasn't, you know, he wasn't put to death. That wasn't the, the penalty. And then right away we see, um, was it Lamech that, that had two wives? And then he killed someone. He's like, okay, well, you know, God's going to protect Cain from being avenged, from being killed by other people then surely he's, you know, if, if it's seven times uh, against Cain, then it's seven, you know, 77 against me. It's like, like, like I'm a lot more justified in what I did than Cain was. And, and people just start to have this attitude, say, oh, well, if it's okay for him, then it's okay for me. And it's, it's a little bit more of acceptance. And, and God changes that after Noah gets off the ark and says, no, if you murder someone, if you kill somebody, um, you're going to be put to death. That's a death penalty punishment. Now, this is this can be a tough pill to swallow, but this, I mean, this is what the Bible says. And this is how much we need to make sure we love God. Jesus Christ said, if you love father or mother more than me, you're not worthy of me. And, you know, if you love son or daughter more than me, you're not worthy of me. And we, I, I get it. I love my children to no end. I love my wife to no end. We need to make sure that our love for God is even greater than that. It has to be. And um, that's the only way that you're going to be able to respect God and, and, and to even obey His commandments is if you have that type of love for Him. Maybe I'll sit up in your chair. Let's turn, if we would, to Deuteronomy chapter 32. We're sticking in Deuteronomy. Now, I understand this is not the law of the land today, but what we're looking at is God's perfect law, okay? This is not what we're, you know, this isn't what we're, we're following today, but if we lived in a perfectly righteous, godly society or country or nation, this is what the laws should be. Um, we, we all should be just serving the Lord and, um, and not allowing for, these are, and you know what? People say, well, if it's, um, well, if someone doesn't want to serve the Lord, then go to one of the heathen nations. That's one of the reasons why there's, you have your choice of different nations. And that's what's going to be really wicked when we have a one world government because you're going to have nowhere to go. You have nowhere to flee, nowhere, nowhere to turn to and say, hey, you know, this group of people over here, I agree with what they're doing. I want to serve this God or whatever. Go to that country because that, that, that's what... And, Throughout history, that's what people have had. You've, you've had uh, um, you know, different regions, different geographic regions. That, hey, they served, did whatever they wanted to do in their area. And if you wanted to serve the Lord, you'd go to Israel. And they accepted foreigners. They accepted strangers. You can come and, and become part of Israel. If, if you lived in one of these other countries, now you weren't able to do certain things in, in regards with the, with, the, with the tabernacle, the temple, but um, you'd still be able to join yourself to become part of them, to love the Lord, to serve Him and everything else, and salvation and be saved and everything else through faith in God. But um, you had that choice to be able to move around and say, okay, well, um, you know, this is where we're going to be. And, and a righteous society, a righteous place to live would have these laws. Look at Deuteronomy 32, look at verse number 16. We're going to see here that the lowercase gods are actually devils. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, verse 16 says, They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God. To gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. And that's kind of interesting. It says new, like these new gods, right? They just, all of a sudden there's this new god. Now, that should be a dead giveaway for anybody if there's this new God, where has he been for all of eternity? How can he even be a God? It's like, hey, we just discovered this new God. Um, no, <laughs> that, that should just, just by default, using a little bit of common sense, yeah, that can't be true. The God, God, if God was truly a God, he's always been around. He's outside of time. He's everlasting. He's eternal. But... Um, you know, they're saying people did, though. They sacrificed unto devil. And these are devils. That, um, that's not God. Uh, verse number 18. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. And when the Lord saw it, look at this, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. God's very serious about that. We saw the death penalty. And now that word abhor, that's a very strong word for hating. You say, well, I don't believe God hates anyone. Let's read verse 19 again. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very forward generation, children in whom is no faith. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. And I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. So God's abhorring and his hatred is on these children in whom is no faith. They've gone after other gods. And anyone who's read the Old Testament knows that like the, the number one main reason why judgment has historically come upon the nation of Israel just time and time again is because they've gone after false gods. Now, they've always been sinners, as, as everybody has. They've had different sins and different wickedness, but when it actually comes to the point where God says, okay, that's it. I'm taking you out of this land. You know, the heathen's going to come in. They're going to judge you. It always happens when they start serving false gods, when they start building the groves, when they start having the idols, when they start doing this other stuff. That's where God's just like, nope, that's where I draw the line. And this is where God also draws the line in Romans chapter 1. Flip there if you would. It's not my notes, but this is a very important concept to understand. It's a concept of, of someone who's rejected by God. We see here, God hated them. They had no faith. They went and started serving other gods. And, and that was enough for God. That kind of crosses a line. We'll see that the line gets crossed with God when people start to just reject God completely and say, I don't want to have anything to do with the Lord. I'm going to serve this other God. And we're going to see that in Romans chapter 1. We'll start reading in um, verse number 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. This is saying that you know, we are without excuse today to understand a little bit about God and that he's real and he created everything. He says, because the, you know, from the creation of the world, it's clearly seen that, that the, we are his creation. We could understand. It says being understood by the things that are made. We are some of the things that are made. We understand, it says, even his eternal power in Godhead. We could come to these understandings. We don't have an excuse to not believe in God. And he's talking about the... Um, the wrath of God being revealed against all ungodliness 
And it says, um, and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So these are people who have the truth, they hold the truth, they know the truth, but they're holding it in unrighteousness. And we're going to explain a little bit further what we mean by that, because he explains, look, we're not, we're without excuse. We have, we understand God. We can receive that truth. But look at verse number 21. It says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, look at verse 24, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. For this cause, for what cause? The cause that they knew God, they knew the, the, the God, they knew this truth, but they glorify Him not as God. They changed it. They rejected God and said, no, no. I know who God is, but I'm going to worship and serve the creature more than the creator. I'm going to, going to create this false God. I'm going to worship a golden calf, for example. I'm going to worship, you know, whatever. A man. It even says here, man. Um, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. And to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. This is the purpose why God gives people up. And it says in, in uh, verse 26, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. This is why the Sodomite is the way they are. They've been given up unto these vile affections because they knew the truth of God, they glorified Him not as God, and they worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. This is what Romans 1 is literally explaining to us. And it goes on and on. I wanted to point that out because... It's the, he does the same thing when an entire nation rejects him. This is talking about the individual. When an individual knows God, they hear about God, they understand God, they reject him and say, nope, I don't want to have anything to do with that God. I want to serve this other God. They become rejected. Well, when the entire nation of Israel, time and time again, would reject God and start serving these other gods, he rejects them and he brings his judgment upon them and he, you know, they, they get carried off into a foreign land and everything else. And then it's not for quite a while. When they finally humble themselves and come back to the Lord, then he'll say, okay, yeah, now I'm going to put you back in your land. But this is how serious he is about not having any other gods before him. And that's, I just wanted to point that out real quick in, in Romans chapter 1. Now, my last point I'm going to make, I'm not going to have time to get into um, commandment 2, which is the idolatry. Again, that, that's an entire sermon in of itself. I'm probably going to preach that one next Sunday. But um, what's really cool about this commandment, what's well, important to understand this, and this might help you understand too, I, um, why the Jews hated Jesus so much, enough to crucify him and kill him and you know, mock him and ridicule him and everything else and do all the things that he did and lie about him, why they wanted him dead so bad is because Jesus Christ claimed to be God in the flesh, claimed to be the Son of God, making himself equal with God. And the Bible says in you know, the Ten Commandments not to have any other gods before me. But, um, and remember commandment two was not to make an image or, or not to bow down or worship anyone. God deserves our worship solely John chapter 20, after Jesus is resurrected from the dead, right? And I love showing this verse to uh, people who don't believe that, that Christ is a deity, that Christ was God in the flesh, that Christ was manifest in the flesh, because if he were of God, knowing the Ten Commandments, knowing that, that, that no, you know, we're not supposed to worship anyone else but God, why did he allow Thomas to worship him. 
And what he said was this. You remember doubting Thomas, right? Thomas wasn't around when Jesus had first, you know, uh, uh, shown himself unto his disciples. He was missing. He appeared unto them. And then they told Thomas, about, hey, man, you know, Jesus, he's like, I'm not going to believe it unless I could put my fingers in the holes in his hands. And, you know, he's like, he's like, I won't believe it. No way. So Jesus shows up again. John 20, 26 says, And after eight days, again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. So Jesus says, Okay, you need proof, Thomas? Here you go. I'm here. I'm real. I'm resurrected. I'm back from the dead. Verse number 28, And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Thomas declares this unto Jesus Christ. My Lord and my God. Did Jesus correct him and say, No, 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 wait, no, I'm not. That's not me. That glory, that credit only belongs unto Jehovah. Did Jesus say that? No way. On the contrary, and I don't know why I didn't copy and paste this because he answers them. And Jesus saith unto Thomas, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. That's how he answers them. He doesn't say, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not your God. You better believe he is. My Lord and my God. That proves it right there. And, and, and again, you know, he wouldn't have been able to accept that if he was a righteous man, if he was just the Son of God and not God in the flesh. He could not accept that type of worship or that type of praise and still be a man of God. Because you see often in, in, in other cases, especially in the book of Revelation and other places where men have seen angels, right? Have come down and angels have talked to them and they fall down and they worship. And he says, wait, you know, get up on your feet. He says, look, I'm a man just like you. The, the apostles did that. They're like, we're just men. Don't, you know, this belongs unto God. You, you don't bow down and worship me. Jesus didn't do that because he was God in the flesh. And... Um, I guess my last, last, last point. Um, turn, if you would, to 1 Kings chapter 11. We're going to see a familiar story of Solomon. Right? Solomon was saved. He was a man of God. But he did something that, that turned his heart away from God. And he actually ended up, at the end of his life, serving other gods. And of all people, you'd think, how could that happen to Solomon? And... I understand that not everyone's in this situation, but definitely for my children, at the very least, can um, need to understand this and, and why it's so important to marry someone who's saved. Marry someone who's a believer in Jesus Christ. You don't want to get married to someone who's unsaved because they can lead your heart away from God. And this is what Solomon did. Solomon had many wives. He had, he had, he had a lot of problems. Okay, he had, he, had, he had way, way too many wives. And the Bible says that, that the king is not supposed to multiply wives unto himself. So he was already in disobedience unto God's commandments when he started having these multiple wives. Okay, but in, in Deuteronomy 7, verse 3, I'll read for you in 1 Kings 11. We'll get there in just a second. Deuteronomy 7, 3 says, Neither shalt thou make marriages with them, talking about the heathen from the other lands, that they didn't, they didn't destroy or the lands that were around about the nation of Israel. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them, thy daughter. Thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son, for they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. In 1 Kings 11, 1, we see the exact, that's the law saying, don't marry the, the heathen. Don't marry them because they're going to turn your heart away. When you're so close to someone, you're tied in so much together, if they're not a believer, if they're not worshiping the Lord, well, odds are they're going to draw you away a lot more than you're going to bring them to God. That's just, I mean, that's reality. And he says not to do that. Um, but we see the perfect example of Solomon. 1 Kings 11, verse number 1 says, But King Solomon loved many strange women. Strange just means that, not that they were weird, but they were foreigners. They were strange. Um, they, weren't, they weren't naturally born in, in, under the, in the tribe of Israel. They were, they were strange foreigners from other lands. Um, but Solomon, King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, 
women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. So he, he dis disregarded God's commandments, disregarded what the Bible says, and said, you know what, but I really love this person. And you have to question Solomon's love anyways when he's got 700 wives and 300 concubines. I mean, how much love can you really have for number 690, right? I mean, it would, <laughs> how much love do you really, really have for that woman when you have more wives then you could even see one for one day for three years. Like it's just, I mean, it's been three years since I saw you last because I've been just seeing all of my other wives for one day. That's insane. But in any case, you know, the Bible says Solomon clave unto these in love. Okay, he loved these women. He wanted them for his wife. And that's what he did. He disregarded God's command. And look what happens. It says, in verse 3, and he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites, and Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father. Everybody needs to take heed lest they fall. Now do I think you're going to take 700 wives and 300 concubines today? No. But Solomon was, he started off his life great. I mean when, when God came to him and asked him and said just you know ask me what do you want? He had a great heart. He said, look, give me wisdom. Give me understanding. I want to know how, to, how I can lead this great people. And he's real humble. And, 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 and you know, was com his heart was right with the Lord. And he built the temple. And he did all these great things. And, and the, the whole nation prospered under his reign and his rule with God's great blessings upon him. But, but he was foolish. He made a really, some really foolish mistakes at the end. And... Um, even someone with all that wisdom, his heart was turned away from his wife because of his wives. That's what, and that's what the Bible says, because of them. It's, they, they turned his heart away from God and, um, and got him to compromise and got him to start building these altars and, and these things, these false gods. So be very, very careful, not just who you marry, marrying number one, of course, but just if, who's your best friend, who are you spending all of your time with? Are they going to be turning your heart away from the Lord? Are they saved? Are they a Christian? You know, the Bible says not to be um, yoked unequally, you know, with, with unbelievers, that we, we need to be equally yoked together. And I believe that's talking about when you get married, you're yoked together. But um, just even in your life, you know, how much people influence you. Obviously, your spouse is going to influence you quite a bit. You're married. Um, but your best friends, things like, you know, people who you spend the most time with will also influence you. Try to make sure that these people are, are Christians so they're not going to turn your heart away from serving the Lord. And especially so you don't get any other God um, before you uh, that's, that would be contradict contradictory to the first commandments. And there's lots of religions out there. There's lots of people who believe all kinds of different gods and all kinds of different things. The Bible says that we need to make sure that we are worshiping the Lord. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for, for your words and for your commandments. God, help us understand them more. Help us to, to be strengthened in your word and to, um, to heed the warnings and to understand the seriousness, dear God, of, of these commands. And not just to, even with other people, with ourselves, we could say, okay, yeah, we're, we love you, God. We're serving you. Our heart is right with you. But um, help us not even to be flippant about other people. Just say, eh, yeah, well, whatever. They're going to choose what they're going to choose because... If they choose to serve another God, they're going to go to hell when they die. And help us to remember that and not to be flippant about it and not to be so permissive necessarily. I mean, obviously we can't force people to believe, but help us to be burdened with a heart to be able to, to care about those people and to not just be so accepting of, of just saying, well, you worship your God and I worship mine and everything's just fine because it's not. That soul is going to go to hell. 
And um, again, we can't force people to believe, but we could at least use our voices to, um, to, to care about that person enough to try, to try to win them over to Christ, dear Lord. And I pray that you would please just increase our wisdom, help us to be able to become better soul winners for you, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.